Good morning, all. I welcome each one of you to this three-day international e-conference on rediscovering cities 2K20. Myself, architect Rita Thun, associate professor from MN School of Architecture, Ambala, will be your host for the day. As you all are aware, this conference was scheduled in the last week of March 2020, but due to the sudden outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, coming times became uncertain. So we all decided to connect through all our participants virtually. Today, we are equally thrilled and delighted to begin this international e-conference. Dear audience, I would like to bring to your notice that this conference is a sequel to the previous national conference, NCRC, held in 2015. The conference got an overwhelming response from researchers across the world. There were around 49 research papers published in the book of proceedings. It was an humble attempt to bring together issues pertaining to the cities on a common platform and initiate a dialogue in rediscovering our roots. City is like a living organism, which adapts to accommodate the changes occurring in the urban environment. But due to the rapid urbanization, city is unable to accommodate all these changes, thus causing urban sprawl and thereby affecting the quality of the life of people. This conference hence aims to provide a platform for deliberations on the various issues and challenges related to the city and its components, formulation of various policies at the government level, and learnings from the past and the present to discover future cities. Let me tell you, the conference shall comprise of two parts. The first part will be the lecture series by eminent architects and academicians of national as well as international stature. And the second part will be the research paper presentations by our scholars and authors. Well, before we proceed, let me introduce you to our convener for the conference, Professor Eva Prasher. Few words about her. Professor Eva Prasher is presently working at MN School of Architecture, Ambala. She's a practicing architect and academician with an experience of 17 years. She's currently pursuing her PhD in urban regeneration of colonial cantonments as historical urban landscape. She has been actively participating in conservation heritage awareness initiatives like Heritage Walk and many more associated programs. I now invite Professor Eva Prasher to please deliver the opening speech. Over to you, Eva. Thank you so much, Rita. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for setting the pitch for me to share my thoughts. A very good morning to everyone present here with us today. I welcome all our respected speakers, presenters, and dear audience to this three-day conference, ICRC 2K20. We had planned this conference in the month of March this year in our campus, but who knew what nature had planned for us? The past few months, have tremendously changed our lives. And uh, we decided to hold this conference uh, online and a heartfelt thanks to all those who supported us and motivated us to go ahead with it. While we are talking here, the number of COVID-19 patients might have increased to some 7 lakh in India and maybe 1.2 crores in the world. And the number of lives it has affected, almost all of us. Could we ever imagine such a situation? Were we ever prepared for it? Rather, are we still equipped to prepare for it? This pandemic has not only brought tremendous misery to humankind and challenges for the medical science, but it also made us all rethink. Rethink about the way we live, the way we understand, the way we teach, the way we work. Also, the way our cities react to crises like this. The present conditions have made us rethink of how we wish to shape our cities. Do we want them to be as the same cities and urban spaces that we grew up with? If no, how do we wish to reclaim our cities after this pandemic? These and many more questions arise in our minds. So dear ladies and gentlemen, here we have for you a platform with researchers and speakers from across the borders to discuss and share their thoughts and researches over rediscovering our cities. With diverse natural systems, hydrology, topography, climatic conditions, there is a huge diversification in the pattern and spatial organization of cities on this planet. While we discuss the current scenario of urban morphology, we need to acknowledge all these contributors. We need to understand that with a shift in culture, beliefs, and traditions, there is a noticeable variation in the way we handle our cities and landscapes. 
We need to acknowledge how we find our cities today is a resultant of stratification of previous and current urban dynamics with a conspicuous role played by many factors, including time, which is why the built heritage within the city fabric is as important as the new iconic structures. Also, if we intend to identify and address the issues related to kinetic cities and change in urban dynamics across the world, we need to consider urban planning as a vanguard action and as the need of the hour. Need for such cities is not alone to plan for the future, but also to fundamentally address the requirements of the present. Thus, city development cannot happen as an event, neither can it be worked out in isolation. Thus, the concept of urbanism cannot be seen through a common lens of vital city concepts that appear utopian, but are meant for cities quite static in nature. We have various contexts, like most of the Indian cities, where uh, vocal components of the city or the settlement are its static and dynamic contributors, like demography and scale that constantly mock the city and its behavior. Thus, there is a huge number of concerns and issues related to the cities. And in an attempt to umbrella most of the aspects, the conference invited papers under three broad themes. First, cities, its issues and challenges. Second, governance and policies. And third, rediscovering our cities. Contributions of abstracts by 110 authors from across the globe proved that there is an invariable increase in the number of academicians and researchers in the field of architecture that are enormously engrossed into the study of evolution of humankind and particularly the cities and its built environment. Although the unprecedented scenario pushed us towards a virtual platform of interaction, here we are with 36 final papers and 68 researchers from across the world. I hope that the contribution by various researchers shared in this conference proved a, proved a food for thought for the new researchers and architecture fraternity, and the efforts would materialize in the form of administrative decisions and policy making. I also anticipate that this will help in resolving the issues and let mankind walk through cities into a new futuristic and more sustainable built environment, as I believe in what Jane Jacobs mentioned. Cities have capabilities of providing something for everybody, only because and only when they are created by everybody. I thank one and all who directly or indirectly has contributed to this conference. I also thank all those who stood by us as guide and mentor. Thanks to all the participants for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Eva. That was a lovely quote by Jane Jacobs. As you rightly pointed out, the cities are growing rapidly and constant being the only change. But is this change holistic? I want to ask my audience, are we really advancing? Are we really creating a livable space for the future generations? We are already facing the repercussions of climate change, fragile ecosystems, polluted cities, unhealthy environment. It's an alarming situation indeed. What is needed is collaboration of enlightened minds as the architects, planners, landscape architects, environmentalists to work as a team and to create resilient communities. I thank you all for joining again in today's lecture series. Before we begin, let me brief you that if you have any questions, kindly type us in the chat box and we shall answer your queries at the end of the presentation. Please note that. So without further ado, I would like you to introduce to our first speaker of the day, Dr. Ibru Ozeke Tukmizai. Few words about man. Dr. Ibru is an architect, a researcher, an author, an academician from Istanbul, Turkey. She's completed the bachelor's in architecture, master's and PhD, all from Imar Sinan University, Istanbul. She has been teaching in her alma mater since 1995. Her specialization lies in architectural history, architecture theory, and philosophy. She's the editor of the symposium book, Architecture, Media, and Art, and the author of the book, Rationality in Architecture. The audience, her topic for today is History in Transformation, the Continuity of Traditional Forms in Modern Turkish Architecture. I welcome you, ma'am, again, to this International E-Conference lecture series 
and please invite you to start your presentation. Uh, just a moment, everyone. There seems to be a, a technical glitch. We will resolve it at a moment. We are resolving this issue. you all from Istanbul, from Turkey. I am very happy to be reaching out to you today through the International Conference on Rediscovering Cities. Although I regret that the conference could not take place physically due to the current situation worldwide, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you via this online session. I would first like to express my gratitude to the organizing committee of the Rediscovering Cities Conference for inviting me to this particular event as a keynote speaker and making this get together possible. I would also like to thank Dr. Architect Surinder Baga, who has been the key point for me in this organization. Then I should congratulate the School of Architecture of the Maharishi Markandeshwar University for this online organization, which has brought together a group of dedicated contributors to add to their field discussions around the main theme of the conference to various issues and challenges related to the city and its components. Looking at the conference program, one can see that, that a valuable group of keynote speakers and contributors will be making their presentations today, tomorrow, and the day after under two topics, namely cities, issues and challenges, and rediscovering our cities. Each of the contributors will point out the different circumstances within this context including the issues of planning, heritage, tradition, environment, sustainability, and others. The conference, in my opinion, will well provide the platform of conversations it has been aiming to, and I hope it will bring new resolutions into the field. I take this chance to greet you once more with the hope to come to India sometime in the future and meet you all in person. Until then, I wish you healthy days. So now we can go on with the presentation. Today I would like to speak to you about the continuity of traditional, or let's say vernacular forms in modern Turkish architecture. I will be concentrating on the kind of architecture which takes tradition as a reference point within the creation of new forms. My focus will be on Turkish architecture of the 20th century. I will try to define in which sense traditional or vernacular forms have been interpreted in contemporary architectural practice within the works of Turkish architects. The idea that a building should be produced in accordance with the nature and the surroundings must be as old as the appearance in history of the human-made settlements. Throughout most of the existence of humanity, people lived in harmony with the nature and the built environment came out as a result of human needs for shelter, safety, storage, transport and the like. These were met by the construction of appropriate buildings and physical morphologies. As contemporary requirements changed, so did the forms to accommodate them. Starting with the earliest builders in our prehistoric past, numerous civilizations have developed building forms that were suited to the materials at hand, the climate in which they lived, and their social systems. 
This is the Chatalhuyuk settlement in central Anatolia, dating back to the 8th millennium BC. It is one of the most important Neolithic settlements in Turkey and one of the earliest in Asia. When people first settled here around 7400 BC, the place was a wetland where the climate was moist and rainy. A wide range of resources were available, including fish, water birds and wild animals. On the drier ground, there were agricultural fields, so the place was very suitable for settlement and for life to grow. Through the years of occupation, the society was under continuous transformation. There was an, an increase in housing and population density. Burials and ritual behavior, behavior also became more elaborate. People buried their dead under their own houses, or in some cases, in special rooms within the pattern, which were called shrines. Houses were roughly rectangular and closely built together with no streets in between. Instead, people moved around on roofs and accessed their homes down a wooden ladder via an opening in the ceiling. At that time, the settlements were not yet surrounded by walls. However, the houses knit together as a massive block will probably act as a protection against outer threats. In Chatalhuyuk, People took great care of their houses, and meticulous planning was an important part of the building process. The walls were constructed of mud bricks. This tradition seems to have carried on over time to the present day. Mud brick has since been one of the most common construction materials in Anatolia, particularly in the middle, eastern, southeastern regions. We can see similar construction methods used in the region even today. Through ages, the change in the built environment would occur cumulatively and on a minimal scale, while the areas of settlement would enhance their urban characteristics over centuries. Thus, traditional architecture has been formed in generations. A well-preserved example of the traditional Turkish village, this is the Cumalı Kızık village near the city of Bursa in the Marmara region of Turkey. The establishment of the village dates back to the early 14th century, the time of the start of the Ottoman state. In the Turkish ag agricultural settlements in Anatolia, villages were not necessarily surrounded by protective walls. In the general setting, the village is surrounded instead by vast agricultural fields. The village pattern, the form, and layout schemes applied in the houses reflect the qualities of early Turkish settlements characterized by narrow streets formed in accordance with the morphology. Along with mud brick, stone and timber were among the popular houses are the local stone for the ground floor and wood for the upper floors. The typology of roofs and the use of colors also add to the visual richness of the settlement. After continuing in a stable speed for ages, the balance of the human nature relationship would transform due to the Industrial Revolution occurring within the Western world at the end of the 18th century. Since then, the momentum of technical innovations would increase the speed and scope of human intervention into the environment. Industrialization, coming to life within decades, would give way to rapid population growth and thus an unplanned urbanization. The modern movement in architecture, starting at the turn of the 20th century, came out as a result of the changing needs and opportunities of the society, aiming to, to make life better for people and suggesting an ideal environment for an ideal society. However, 
the social mission of our modern architecture could never totally be achieved, while the modern way of living would place even substantial burdens on the existing city structures, such as commerce, changing land use and zoning, transportation, and growing population density. As a reaction against the negative impacts of industrialization on the nature and the city, the consciousness regarding environmental problems and artistic practice increased in the late 20th century, particularly after the 1960s. Through the following decades, respect for the environment encouraged the use of compatible technologies in architecture and the tendency towards ecological resilience seems to have influenced the field since then. The architectural tendency of environmental orientation would receive various names. Sustainable architecture, ecological architecture, green architecture, bioclimatic architecture, eco-architecture, environmentally conscious architecture, intelligent architecture, to cite but a few. Among these, the term sustainable architecture seems like an all-inclusive title, which has been used to define the field since the second half of 1990s. It originates from the concept of sustainable development, and it has to be understood as satisfying the present necessities without creating future developmental problems and without compromising the demands of future generations. We can define sustainable architecture as a way of designating buildings that make maximum use of natural resources and also reduce as much as possible the environmental impact on the ecosystem and its inhabitants. While the influence of sustainability in architecture inspired many architects to engage in the process of reconciliation between the built environment and social, cultural and ecological requirements, Sustainable design has become one of the most important and internationally endorsed principles in the world of architecture, particularly in the 21st century. Liberated from mostly formal frameworks, architects, when planning sustainable architecture, take into account building materials, energy sources, and the effect that a building's construction will have on its surroundings. Moreover, such issues have become the main reference point for a large number of scientific debates, academic research, and scholarly organizations worldwide. In recent years, there has also been a growing interest in vernacular or traditional architecture in terms of its sustainable potential. Sustainability has environmental, social, economic and cultural dimensions and traditional or vernacular architecture seems to correspond with each of these fields since it is dependent on local factors like climate and natural resources as well as the strongly established cultural structures of a given community. The generally not written rules that define the vernacular or traditional architecture of a particular area are handed down through generations resulting in a formal continuum. Now let's turn to 20th century Turkish architectural practice to see the specific case of modernism and tradition in this country. Accordingly, one should first consider the establishment of the Turkish Republic in 1923, which marked the start of a new era for Turkey by ending the Ottoman Empire and many of its, of its institutions. In the early years of this new state, the reflections of the process of rapid reformation would well reach the architectural medium. Turning its face into the Western world, Turkish architecture would have its share of the modern movement which was seen as a means of social and cultural reformation. This would result in the construction of modernist buildings throughout the country, and particularly in the new capital city Ankara. 
Here are two examples of the early Republican rationalist architecture by Turkish architects. The first is the exhibition house built in Ankara in 1934 by architect Şevki Balmuncu. Another example is the Florya Atatürk Seaside Mansion built in Istanbul in 1935 by architect Seyfi Arkan. However, the influence of modernism in Turkish architecture would often be interrupted by the appearance of local revivalisms. Through decades, architectural practice in Turkey was shaped on the struggle between modern influence on one side and efforts to create a national identity in architecture by the use of regional or historical motifs on the other. These two tendencies alternated each other in periods until 1960s, where one can see the almost simultaneous appearance of local revivalisms and modernist approaches. In fact, the continuity or at least interpretation of traditional architectural forms has been highly appreciated in the process of design long before it was associated with sustainability. During the initial decades of the 20th century, historic residential architecture gradually gained a more significant place in the general understanding of architectural heritage. In Turkish Republican architecture, the tendency to look at traditional architecture for inspiration in the design of contemporary buildings actually came out as a reaction against the universality of the modern movement and was applied within the mission of creating a national identity through architecture. An early attempt was the National Architectural Seminars starting in 1934 led by Sedat Hakkı Eldam at the Academy of Fine Arts in Istanbul, aiming at the documentation of Turkish vernacular architecture. The seminars formed the basis of the examination of nearly 1,500 examples of Turkish civil architecture to be documented and analyzed in terms of plans and other architectural elements, such as the windows, doors, and details. Through this study, Adam finalized his typological classification of the traditional Turkish house, and his findings were published in his book series, such as The Turkish House, The Yıldız of the Bosphorus, Turkish Gardens, and Yapa. Actually, Adam was one of the key figures of the 20th century Turkish architecture, who stood midway within the current debate between regionalist and universalist tendencies. His involvement in local residential architecture also led to a series of buildings inspired by the Ottoman Yildiz, which were seaside mansions of the Bosphorus in terms of plan and in details like cantilevers, canopies, and lattices. The Tashlı Coffee House built in Istanbul in 1948 appears as the ultimate built manifesto of Eldam's quest for the native or national style. In plan, it was an exact replica of a late 17th century yıldır, which he claimed was a conscious attitude for manifesting the modern qualities of the original domestic architecture. Through his career, Erdem settled upon a style which, although modernist in material and technology, abstracted the elements of traditional residential architecture, such as white canopies, row windows, cantilevers, and proportions in a rational interpretation thus producing a modern vocabulary out of a rich tradition. This style manifests itself through the architect's later career, including a range of private and public buildings. As in the case of Adam and his followers, the use of the formal qualities of traditional or vernacular building practice in contemporary architectural design was at first hand approached as an identity problem, therefore mainly aimed at reinterpreting the formal qualities of vernacular architecture. In fact, around 1960s, 
Many Turkish architects were engaged in a reassessment of the tenets of the modern movement, leading them to seek a new regionalism in architectural expression as an answer to the dominance of the international style. Between 1963 and 1972, Aldam worked on the design of the Social Insurance Association's building in Zeyrek, Istanbul. The neighborhood in those years was a particular historical quarter of Istanbul with the existence of tombs, traditional mansions and the Zeyrek Mosque. The architect was challenged to design in harmony with the traditional architecture of the surrounding area. Designed with a contemporary function and technology, the timeless qualities of the traditional environment were applied in the building, in the fragmented layout of the complex, as well as its dynamism in the third dimension. The repeated use of cantilevers would also conform to the traditional character of the surrounding area, manifesting the contextual approach of the architect. This project won the Ahan Award for Architecture in 1986, for it is as disciplined and rational as the modernist canon requires, yet without compromising its modernity, it responds to its regional context, respecting the historic landmarks nearby, and remains sensitive to its site, which is a steeply sloping plot at the corner of a major intersection. Another modern interpretation of the timeless qualities of traditional Turkish architecture built around the same decades was the Istanbul Textile Traders Market built by the Don Tekeli Sami Sisa Architectural Partnership between 1959 and 1968. The complex was built in the same neighborhood as the Social Insurance Association's building at the opposite side of the main street, aiming to provide appropriate space for the textile traders. The site of the project was close to some of the predominant monuments of the historical peninsula, including the Suleymaniye Mosque from the 16th century, which we can see in the silhouette uh, at, at the back, and the Bozlan Aqualact remaining from the Roman period. Tekeli Sisa partnership took into account the scale and pattern of the existing settlement to provide a modern trading area. Instead of placing a large-scale single building, the complex was designed as separate small units arranged together around inner courtyards and walking areas. While the units of the complex had a rational geometrical aesthetic following the modern movement, the main reference point of the complex was the Çarşı, the trading area in traditional Turkish towns, which was an integral part of the urban pattern. The Çarşı existed in a central part of the town, comprised of different formed and scaled buildings gathered around the central axis. The Çarşı districts, forming in the Ottoman Istanbul and Bursa cities, are particular examples of traditional Çarşı complexes. Following this reference, the layout of the Istanbul Textile Traders Market conformed to the morphology of the charges as well as the existing urban pattern. Around the 1970s, one can see the rise in the interest of the architects of the time towards vernacular traditional architecture in terms of its sustainable qualities. Differing from a mainly formal reinterpretation aiming to form a national character for Turkish architecture, the environmental, social and cultural qualities of traditional forms would start to be studied and practiced in local and mostly small-scale buildings. Soon after, the term critical regionalism was in introduced into the Western architectural discourse. Feyyaz Arpi, an architect and educator at the Middle East Technical University, 
was in charge of the design of a secondary school in the Gilindere village near Mersin in the southern region of Turkey. The school was designed and built by a group of architectural students as part of their summer internship within two months with the help of the local villagers. The hot climate of the region and the sloppy morphology of the site were the main factors that determined the design, along with the northeaster wind peculiar to the region which obliged the complex to be close to north. The school comprises of four classrooms and an office section gathered around an open courtyard. The modular planning would allow the school to be extended in the future by the addition of new classrooms and freely organized organized service sections, which would add to the sustainable qualities of the complex. The construction was completed in two months within the use of local stone, concrete bricks and timber. Walls were not plastered, but whitewashed with lime. Red ochre paint was used on timber elements. Any detail that would need continuous repair was avoided in the construction. The whole process was also an example of collaborative work where the initiative of the local villagers came together with the labor of university students. Another interesting example of the use of regional architecture characteristics in new design is a family summer house built in Çanakkale in 1971 by architect Sedat Gürel. Gürel was an architect and educator who produced a very small number of architectural works. In the creation of this summer house, he built for his own family and close friends. He took into account the landscape and the nature by placing the buildings in accordance with the environment. The point of departure was the local architectural language, local materials and details, and the way of life in harmony with the region. The seven small units are distributed around in order to form open living areas to recreate a small-scale tradition. The positioning of the buildings, their separation from the outside by a stone wall, their inward orientation, and the development of inner courtyards sufficient unto themselves, all of which are characteristics of the region, were successfully employed here in a novel interpretation. This project won the Ahan Award for Architecture in the 1989 cycle. In that cycle, one of the jury members was the Indian architect Charles Correa, who at first sight admired and defended this project all through the process with the belief that it proposed a tip typological, sustainable solution for all residential projects. From the jury statement, this housing compound, designed by an architect for himself and his family, extends along the crest of a rocky side, sloping downward to a beach. Hugging the stone boundary wall parallel to the road, yet informally arranged among the pine, olive and oak trees, are seven small, spare and simple, one-story, stuccoed and whitewashed buildings, traditionally constructed in masonry, with timber ceilings and clay tile roofs. Two of the units are for living and four are for sleeping. The seventh is a common service unit adjacent to the parking space. The original vegetation has been allowed to remain and the footpaths are paved with beach pebbles. The jury found this residence to be a work of art in which nature and humanism occupy the first place. Another key figure in 20th century Turkish architecture, Turgut Cansever, designed the Demir Tourism Complex in Bodrum in 1971, inspired by the timeless qualities of traditional architecture. Bodrum is a town in the western part of Turkey, near the Aegean Sea, and by the time of the project, its touristic potential was nearly being discovered. The summer complex consists of residences, hotels, and recreational areas 
where the architect designed 18 villas spread over a nearly 3 hectares of land built of thick, load-bearing stone. Here, one would encounter a low-density topography-oriented environment with pedestrian roads crossing over. The one, two and three-story houses were engaged in a way to encounter the view and the focal points of the settlement. The main references of the project were simplicity within diversity, standards within differentiation, geometrical purity, harmony with the nature, neighborhood relations, ease of access, and pedestrian pr priority. The project won the Ahan Award for Architecture in the 1992 cycle. Actually, Turkutcan Sevar was the only architect to receive this award three times in his career, the other two projects being the Ertegün Summer House in Bodrum and the Turkish Historical Society building in Ankara, which were both awarded in the 1980 cycle. Another predominant residential project which takes advantage of the architectural characteristics of the environment is the mass housing project in Şanlıurfa designed by Erdoğan Elmas and Zafer Gülçür in 1996. Şanlıurfa is one of the hottest and driest cities of Turkey in the southeastern region of the country. The basic architectural and urban elements of the region consist of buildings with closed courtyards, narrow and shady streets, as well as fountains and other waterworks. The old city fabric is dense and intricate. Streets are bare, while courtyard walls are lively decorated. The project consists of low and high-rise blocks. The low-rise buildings follow the traditional regional courtyard style, while the high-rise apartments also refer to the architectural vocabulary of the region, providing easy access between house, courtyard and street. The project follows principles similar to the specific rich typology of the old city, ensuring a sense of cultural continuity to link the past to the future. Taking into account the economics, the risks, the houses were built out of masonry brick. With this project, the architects were awarded with the National Architectural Prize of Architects in 1996. Another significant figure in 20th century Turkish architecture was Cengiz Bektaş, whose practice was commonly associated with interpretation of traditional architecture as well as care for environmental issues. Having developed his architectural discourse around the theme of Anatolia, Bektaş's main goal in his practice had been to recognize the geography and culture of this land in consciousness and achieve its sustainability. This is the Olvia Social Center that Bektaş designed in 1999 for the students of the Akdeniz University in Antalya. The complex consisted of theaters, conference halls, art rooms, gallery, meeting rooms, and a commercial center containing bookstores and takeaway food shops. The layout follows the notion of a curved road with built elements on both sides leading to a 1200-seated amphitheater. A water channel flows along the road and links two wider spaces between which stands a clock tower. The name Olvia comes from the ancient city nearby. The stone walls of the buildings are constructed using traditional wall techniques while local cedar tree is used in timber construction. The Old View Cultural Center project won the Ahan Award for Architecture in the 2001 cycle, for it proposes a modern design vocabulary 
derived from the traditional and historical motifs of the region to form an all bonding central space for young people. The B2 house is a summer residence built in 2001 by architect Han Tümertekin in a small traditional village with 450 villages at the western coast of Turkey. The simple rectangular block differs from the traditional houses of the village in form. However, the building uses local materials and building techniques in order to achieve a reconciliation in architectural language. The house is placed on the slope of the mountain and uses terraces to make maximum use of the land, just like the local houses do. The project won the Ahan Award for Architecture in 2004 from the jury report. A two-story house made of concrete and handcrafted stone. The balcony on the upper level is a steel construction with wooden floor finishing that extends towards the house. Aluminium frames and shutters are used for the windows. The latter are filled with handcrafted reed, helping the interior of the structure remain cool. The house requires little maintenance and is ideally suited for a person with a nomadic lifestyle seeking temporary accommodation. Lastly, I would like to mention the Center for Intensive Education, designed by architects Mehmet Kükükçoğlu and Ertuğ Uçar, built between 2012 and 2016 in Konya, a city in the central Anatolian region. This is a complex designed for autistic people, their families and the general public, consisting of both indoor and outdoor spaces for education, sports, arts and recreation. The design idea follows up the tradition of math structures, powerfully exemplified in Çatalhöyük, that is in the same geographical region, one of the oldest settlements on earth, which I have already mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. Later Adaba villages manifest the continuity of the building culture in the region. Single-story adobe houses coming together to form an organic pattern is peculiar to the traditional villages of central Anatolia. The small rectangular units with different functions are knit together by narrow pathways to inform an inner street in the project. The project also considers the climatic conditions of the region and uses terracotta panels to cover the surfaces providing light control. This project received the National Architectural Award from the Turkish Chamber of Architects in 2014 for its innovative and original space syntax, holistic design approach, and the use of natural material to perform an environment-sensitive contextualism. Vernacular or traditional architecture has for long been a source of inspiration for architects. In the early years of the 20th century, Turkish architects referred to vernacular architecture with the aim of producing a national architectural identity, while after 1970s, the use of its sustainable characteristics became the main motivation. Along with private residences, house groups and a small amount of public buildings of which I have cited but a few. Eco villages and eco farms emerging since 1990s also add to the practice of sustainable architecture. However, the amount of built examples of such architecture in Turkey is still less than desired when compared to the general practice. As a specialist and a constant learner in architectural history, I assume that the creation of a truly sustainable built environment depends much on the integration of vernacular knowledge with modern knowledge, 
which would result in the development of buildings and settlements that are contemporary and modern, while fitting with their cultural and environmental contexts. This could be defined as the modern vernacular. Moreover, it is delighting to know that the research on such architecture has become a mainstream academic activity in the 21st century. An up-to-date investigation focusing on the studies on vernacular architecture among the research community demonstrates that the annual number of studies on vernacular architecture has shown a sharply increased trend since the year 2007, indi indicating the greater interest on its sustainable qualities and their potential applications. This is a result of the need to respond to climate change, environmental pollution, and the desire to decrease energy consumption. According to the same research, India and Turkey are among the top 10 countries concerning the number of publications on vernacular architecture, showing that both countries have emerged as research centers of vernacular architecture. This seems quite expressive, since both Turkey and India have strong traditional architectural values to take into account while working on contemporary building design and construction. Moreover, both countries raised world-renowned architects who have effectively carried on their architectural contextualism in the 20th century. Recently, Indian architect Romy Kosla has received the 2020 International Contextual Architecture Award from Antalya Kepes Municipality in Turkey, given in memory of Turkish architect Turgut Cansever. Kosla, like Cansever, is known for his environment-sensitive approach to architecture. Mr. Kosla was also a member of the Ahan Award Technical Review for the 1986, 1989 and 1992 cycles. This, in my opinion, is another indicator of the common features between the two cultures in regard to their approach towards the interpretation of traditional and contextual values within present-day architecture. Today, the way that our cities respond to the pressures and challenges and sorting them has become more important than it was in any period of the history of mankind. The knowledge that can be derived from the examination of local architecture, which has evolved in time reflecting environmental, cultural, technological and historical contexts, is and will continue to be of particular importance in the process of developing sustainable qualities to employ in contemporary planning activities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ebru, for your insightful thoughts and taking us through the journey of Turkey's rich architectural heritage and through the modern architecture. These architectural elements have really narrated a story which echoes in our heart forever. And there is so much to learn from my history, I can see, but the buildings have the right balance of science and aesthetics to it. I believe sustainability is the need of the hour, as you said, because sustainable development is the masterful balance of meeting our own needs without jeopardizing the future generation's ability to do the same. What is also important is to have reverence for architectural heritage. We already have a few questions for you, ma'am. We already have a few questions in the chat box. I would like to take a few. The first is, uh, historic urban fabric needs to be preserved as well as new architecture will come up. How to strike a balance between the both? Uh, in my opinion, I think uh, historical architecture and new architecture will and uh, should always exist together. So there's no way of um, uh, 
making them in, in separate separate places so, so the cities are getting larger and larger so uh, the best thing should be that they both should respect each other uh, first the historical buildings should be preserved with a uh, with an um, with a modern function with a new function and then uh, the, the, the new buildings which should be built around uh, should should respect to the, to the historic ones so they should get together uh, along get along together in a, in a uh, better condition I think like uh, like some of the work that I have shown here uh, uh, actually uh, get uh, answer this question this question well uh, what, if you look at the buildings uh, some of the buildings of Sadataka Adam or uh, some of the other buildings built in historical sites and you, you can of course uh, give more examples to such kind of architecture uh, not only from Turkey or India but uh, from the whole world uh, so uh, you, you should look at them and uh, then you can find a way to uh, uh, make the two live together I think Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. There is a little voice. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, do, do, do you hear me? Is there a problem with the voice? Ma'am, it is a little disturbance uh, from your end. A little. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, I, I do hear you. But yeah, you can hear me clearly. A problem with... mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, then uh, another question. Sustainability is the need of the future. What will be the factors that will help in making a sustainable settlement? There's a question which says, uh, it, yeah, what are the factors yeah, that will... I, well, the, the, the only, uh, I mean, the, the essence of this, I mean, the essence of making a, some kind of a sustainable architecture should be uh, to take into account, uh, at first, uh, the natural and cultural characteristics of the area. Uh, so, I mean, if, if we don't uh, get away from them, uh, oh, if we don't get away from nature, if we don't get away from culture, from tradition, then uh, we will not uh, be getting far from sustainability, I think, because uh, we have the examples of uh, the sustainability of traditional or vernacular forms, which have proved themselves to be sustainable because they have been coming, uh, they, they have been alive until now and they will be alive for more uh, so from, from today. Uh, so I think that the only and the, the, the essence of this is uh, to take into account the nature and culture. I, I, this is what I believe. I and mean, I try to exam uh, exemplify this kind of architecture here. So this is my belief. All right. Now one more. Uh, one thing is today's sustainability plays a very important role, but layman doesn't understand the need of sustainable building. They find it very costly. How can one create sustainable building environment with low budget? Low budget. I think, again, here the answer is uh, is traditional or the vernacular. Right. Uh, you can look at the, uh, the, the, the building materials. I mean, you don't have to uh, have a very huge budget to, to make some kind of sustainable architecture, I believe. Uh, because when you look at tradition and when you look at the environment, uh, look at the vernacular architecture, you can understand that uh, the, the only um, money or, or high budget is not something that you uh, you you have to have uh, to make sustainable architecture. But it should be simple. The more the, the simpler it is, then I think the more sustainable it would be. Because when you make buildings or with like uh, uh, high technology or like with high budget, then uh, it's it's even more difficult to um, to make them uh, live longer. So I think uh, nature would give us again the answer for this. Right, ma'am. So simplicity is the answer in terms of yes, planning yes. and design the, the best thing is and the materials yeah. and right, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I would request you to speak a little louder. I think we all are having a problem okay. hearing your voice. Uh, okay, I I think. I think yeah, that is a better. problem with the with the internet connection the or something. I'm sorry for this. No, no, ma'am, I understand. If you can just speak a little louder, it will help all of us to hear. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ma'am, one more. Uh, they say, what is your take on historic urban landscape and its possibility applicability in high dense urban areas in country like ours, like the developing countries? about the historic uh, urban landscape and how it's applicable in the high dense urban areas like the growing city, the urbanization. 
how is it the historical urban landscape how can be related to the uh, the modern urbanization which is happening how can I we think, do that i, I think what think... what should be done is not is not to only copy the uh, right. the, the historical facts but uh, just taking the essence of historical or traditional or vernacular or whatever we say uh, that, that kind of architecture we should take take the essence of it right. and try to ap apply it into the new buildings uh, try to apply it into the new en environments that we are forming so that yeah. there will be a continuity or uh, so that uh, we can uh, we can achieve a continuum of this, uh, of the two uh, so, I mean, the essence, I mean, as I have already said, the simplicity or right. uh, the, because it, it is, it forms, it, it comes out because of needs, because of simple needs. So, right. uh, well, if we continue that, uh, then the, uh, the, the result should uh, still be sustainable, I think, I believe. Right. Like, uh, you, can, you can design it according to the context, the present context. Uh, so context is very important. Yes, the present the context and uh, and uh, uh, taking the inspiration, taking the inspiration right. from the essence right. of uh, the, the traditional architecture, but not not merely not only copying okay. the forms Absolutely. or not only taking historical forms and copying them here and there. But uh, I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking right. about uh, the the continuity of the essence, the con Absolutely. the continuity of the soul of the uh, right. traditional places. Right, absolutely. A building should have a spirit and a soul. Mm -hmm. Then it plays a vital role. I agree. Uh, one more coming, ma'am. Uh, what do you think how landscaping plays a crucial role in any building environment? It's about landscape. What is the proper discipline of pro proving landscaping to any space? Sorry, providing any landscaping to any space. What she means is, what kind of landscape uh, you suggest in any building environment? I, what is the proper discipline of providing a, uh, a methodology of doing landscape, a sustainable landscape? Uh, is, uh, I mean, a sustainable landscape from, uh, I mean, uh, around a, a historical area or a traditional area? Or I just could not get this question so well, I think. Uh, yeah, I think what, uh, what she uh, means to say is about, you know, how landscape plays a very important role in sustainability. So about the yes. built environment and uh, uh, the overall yes. the environment. Apart with the uh, obviously we're speaking only architecture, yes. but also landscape. And what is the methodology? Is, is there a methodology that we follow? Uh, from I mean, from uh, like this get rid of the landscape. You should of course you should of course uh, preserve the, the qualities of the landscape. Right. Uh, if if this is what is meant, because I'm not really sure if I could just get the question right. I'm sorry for that. Uh, right, because sometimes the voice is coming and going, and so I'm not uh, really catching uh, every okay, word Hello. that you're saying. Hello, I hear yeah. you. Do you hear me? Uh, yes, ma'am. The, the voice is a little low, and it's not very clear. Yes. Can you hear okay. me now? Yes. Yes, I do hear you. But sometimes the voice goes and comes. And so uh, oh. if, 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 if this is what is meant, uh, I think the, uh, the the cultural and first the natural and then the cultural qualities of the landscape of the of the right. natural surrounding natural environment or the built environment also because when we say landscape then we we have also a built environment so that we, Agreed. that we should cope with uh, right. so uh, the the characteristics uh, the years long uh, formed characteristics of such landscapes should be preserved and uh, they should be well integrated to the new buildings to the new right. uh, to the new environments right so this is how i believe about the landscape right also preserving the natural flora and fauna of yes the, the, na place, the nature the indigenous yes. yeah the, yes right. sure of course agree agree without question yeah just the last question ma'am and uh, what are the possibilities of historical structural materials which can be used in contemporary buildings to produce a sustainable structure Okay. So, what are the uh, um, takeaway from the historical well, uh, structural in, material? In, yeah. In the specific case of Turkey, adobe yeah. or mud, mud brick is uh, one of the uh, most mostly used uh, yeah. historical construction uh, materials. Uh, so we can, as I have already mentioned, that we, we we see such kind of architecture in Central Anatolia even today. The soil, soil because it's not, it can be found everywhere. 
it's not it's not very uh, expensive so it's cheap so it's quite simple uh, so it's a way i think uh, soil or adobe architecture is a is one of the materials that uh, should can be used for uh, for new buildings uh, and also timber and stones but but it should depend on the local um, you know, local qualities or local availabilities uh, wherever you can find stone or wherever you can find timber uh, so uh, it, it should be um, i mean the, the the, the materials should not really be expensive or should not come from different places, but should be local, I think. Uh, this is uh, the, the, um, the most important feature of uh, this kind of architecture, I think. Right, right. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if, if that's uh, all, but I mean, uh, yes, yes. if I could answer to uh, the, the questions. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. I think this is very insightful uh, and very thoughtful very inspirational uh, lecture. We've learned a lot. And thank you for being here thank and taking you. your time. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you once Thank again. you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. 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 Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. Well, keeping the spirits. Well, thank you, ma'am. We're keeping the spirits high for yet another journey of vibrancy. We move to our second presentation of the day. The topic being City Vibrancy of Life, Mechanics of System. And the esteemed speaker is architect Hemantwala from India. I welcome you, sir. A few words about architect Hemantwala. Architect Hemantwala is an architect, interior designer, academician from Ahmedabad. His professional as well as academic career spans for almost 40 years. There are more than 40 research papers to his credit. He has a flair for writing and has written on art, architecture, design, city planning, and Hindu philosophy. He has been an illustrator for a few religious books as well. Presently, he is a design chair at Asmita College of Architecture, Mumbai. I extend a very, very warm welcome to you, sir, and I invite you to start your presentation, please. Namaskar. First of all, I hope you all must be in good health in this epidemic of COVID-19. Let me make it clear first that this is not a regular scholarly paper talking about so much data collection and analysis of it. I am simply going to share my basic concerns for life in cities. Whenever there's a discussion on cities, I start wondering if cities are really planned with man in center or something else. Does city addresses to finer aspects of human existence or it is a mechanism to provide facilities? How far cities are sensitive towards human existence in totality? Every development that has taken place in the history of mankind, every design that has been developed, every invention that has been worked upon, everything that man has created is primarily to add value to his life. The question is, are cities developed with a similar spirit in required intensity, with its required intensity? In other words, are cities man-centric or some other forces are major players in city planning? Is society focusing on vibrations of life or it is just working out systems in which man will have to find his lot? We need to ask many questions so that we can look at answers. The kind of questions we have will not only define area of our answers, but also will decide the kind of outcome we expect from cities. The questions could be, is it true that when one decides to stay in cities majorly, there is a feeling of compulsion rather than a choice? Or is it true? that city dwellers are indifferent towards many city conditions or 
have people agreed to mechanical life because that is the only choice left with them or have pp dwellers city dwellers became insensitive for many finer aspects of life and they have become ignorant of such things or they are so used to the dictating conditions of nature of city that they don't think beyond few things if you ask such kind of questions and if answers are not that encouraging then for the larger interest of society larger interest of people we must deliberate on these issues yes it is true that city planning is a complex task determinants are many and very unpredictable too few of them are constantly changing as well more so this determinants make planning process very complex the present day as well as future targets takes very strange directions more so there are no set methodology and planning standards that assures minimum benchmark to understand present form of cities one needs to know basic criteria that are considered for city planning what are the basic concerns what are the priorities what reference data one relies on with what considerations basic decisions are made and in all what is the importance given to a man and check if any changes are required often when determinants the nature what determines the nature of outcome is the concerns defined and priorities established in the beginning the initial steps often decides the direction one is going to take if at initial stage quality of human life is considered as very crucial very important the city planning will have greater vibrancy of life or if in the beginning only the set concerns and priorities are of different kinds the outcome will dramatically be different it is often assumed that by providing facilities the quality of life gets addressed too yes but to a material level only while living intense city life one requires something more than that when we have to touch emotions go beyond mere rationals go beyond mere, mere rational solutions try to establish connects give feeling of belongingness introduce a sense of pride and more here let me tell that the slide shown here indicates four things first topic described with some bulleted explanations second summary of these issues in blue capital bold letters third some visuals that reflects critical city life and fourth the observation on these visuals now in this slide the final statement that i am making in capital blue is man is a social animal and city is an opportunity to prove that city is a large institute where things happen for this social animal and the visual says that at night city changes its face creating wonderful opportunities to add to the quality of life meaning one needs to consider 24 by 7 concept 24 4 by 7 human life in city planning okay if we look at present scenario critically there is a need to focus on few things one needs to understand for planning of cities what one starts with what is the starting point and how the route has been decided the point of beginning has a great impact on the nature of end product also in city planning with what kind of reference information we begin with on what basis with what information one starts do we have all required information data 
that can help us to take conscious sensitive decisions carefully and if we don't have enough such data for focusing on quality of life how we can build up that as the final product greatly depends on what one starts with let there be enough range of ideas at early stage itself incorporating finer aspects of life if one is starting city planning with mechanical system such system will surely dominate the way city evolves and if the nature of human experiences is what one starts with the city design will take all together different form it does not mean that while thinking of human experiences the mechanical system will have many compromises and it may miss function the functioning of such system can be worked out for its perfect efficiency by panel of experts panel of consultants all must to do features of every mechanical systems are to be followed but in the process the human aspirations must not get sacrificed the way one decides the technical requirements for mechanical systems one can also establish minimum benchmark for quality of life to address to at different scale of different kinds for different intentions addressing to different social groups in fact we have many standards and suggestions for mechanical systems but standards for quality of life and human experiences are stated with lot of subjectivity without much systematic scientific research it is often based on personal judgment or assumptions or even prejudices we need to understand how many people stay in city because of quality of life life it offers not just because of employment it generates in such matters if our reading turns out to be negative what we must deliberate on with priority in different forms in last statement of slide my last statement of slide is problem identification is a key issue for getting appropriate solution one needs to know exactly what one is looking for the visual here addresses to ident incidental markets incidental markets is very peculiar phenomena of indian culture it is such so much versatility life range vibrancy all this it must get proper place in cities okay then what kind of questions queries can lead to more relevant understanding i don't personally overlook importance of other areas but here the focus is on vibrancy of life we need to know whether city city should be vehicle centric or man centric can infrastructure facilities be more considerate or other determinants of city planning and also to human life what should be advisable ratio of land use for vehicular movement against total land available what is advisable distribution of land for different activities in city in indian context in indian cultural conditions for indian culture for our people where all in city when we look for some sympathetic approach how to create pockets that can give sense of relief and also belongingness what can be core concern and as against the likely infills in contemporary city planning what are the concrete steps taken to systematically address to the issue of identity and dignity of a man during expansion what could change and what must remain constant and many more such questions should be asked in every form our planning process is relying more on data that talks about quantity if we see critically 
in census survey also the data is collected of quantifiable things qualifiable plays major role quantifiable plays major role as against the qualifiable ones in planning also in the process who will address to final aspects of quality of life so one needs to ask series of questions that will give better understanding for what can still be expected from city qualitatively my last statement for the slide here is issues are many solutions are diverse one needs to streamline with focus on quality of life the visuals here tell every place is an opportunity having economical cultural social personal significance you can see that how people convert opportunity in a given situation looking at the history of town planning one can see that many models are attempted all these models are thematically conceptually and product wise quite different from each other what is the message finally what are we looking at what we are trying for why such dramatic differences one will talk about high rise city and other will strongly advocate for nicely spreaded garden city maybe with the green belt one will start city planning with setback principle and other planner will have great fascination for geometric patterns with such vast thematic differences what are we trying for or are we just experimenting with the human life it is true that with development of technology nature of infrastructure changes and that has to be taken into consideration one requires constant upgradation in that too but human values and human aspirations aspects of human dignity and human emotions remain constant and how much importance is given to this aspects constant aspects is a question the aspects that are constant and that are more important how much importance is given to that in modern city planning it seems structured human activities are like in fill plugged into where possible so one works out systems and find possibilities to plug in other activities it is also fact that every city planned in last one century is getting criticized that too very harshly it is quite shocking the main considerations for criticism is either inconvenience or disregards for nature and environmental conditions or traffic problems no analysis is addressing to human dignity or human values or such important things trying different models means playing with quality of human life this is what i am trying to say here the visual here addresses to heritage heritage is not for photography it is to inspire from what our ancestors has celebrated okay as said city planning is criticized there are many problems that creates many others that is because cities are largely becoming vehicle centric the manner in which transportation is given importance it's it's important but how much that is a question vehicle movement and parking requirements are eating up good portion of city land and also strategic land and also planning concerns one often gets an impression that cities are designed to promote car industry i repeat there is a feeling that cities are designed to promote car industry can there not be an alternative solution like working on a development model 
where residential and commercial activities of a family gets accommodated in a single unit or making every cluster self sufficient in area decided based on walking distances or roads designed only for public transport or any such other car free ideas it is strange and unfortunate as well that quite few of our city ideas are based on western models that have already failed criticized rejected it is not a question of such failure only the most serious question is of irrelevance the country where resources are different where people's habits and priorities are different where social structure is of a different type where human values and relationships are of different height where context is different where meaning of social discipline is also dramatically unique why models should be blindly followed there are attempts made that would have better relevance but even for that the point of beginning lies somewhere with the western ideology of city here i say when cars start dictating our life we enter into the world of slavery we become slaves of vehicles and whatever infrastructure gets developed because of that vehicle the visual here addresses two problems vehicles are least accommodative and so have larger and stronger demands often dictating people's life people's behavior people's responses one needs to understand what possibilities are available to decide from the concept of supporting versus supported is very unique in many ways one needs to decide what attributes should be assigned what status this kind of understanding addresses to pair of somewhat opposites and one needs to find a balance with well defined priorities the list could broadly include core versus infill as we said before supporting versus supported so core versus infill ideal versus practical concentrated and well distributed with in general reach versus distant qualitative decisions versus quantitative one ordered versus accommodative conditions like one must decide what should be ordered in what manner for what purpose with what characterization as against what should be left more accommodative in nature we can also talk about system based versus crafted well defined versus open ended human versus mechanical and many more such criteria can be decided and priorities can be established it is important to be very careful and sensitive while deciding for either or after making a decision the other aspect should also be considered to its required magnitude you cannot just ignore that such an understanding will help deciding whether core concern this is important whether core concern should be derived from a definite theory or theory should be based on core concern my last statement of the slide is what is essential must get support from secondary attributes and through visuals here i am trying to address to cultural behavior culture cannot be an occasional phenomena in city it must be like everyday engagement okay life in city cannot be so easily generalized there are many dimensions to it but one can surely talk about larger perception life in city is perhaps as many have said mechanical disconnected earning centric 
compartmentalized, more formal, hectic, stressful, identityless, monotonous, imposed in some form, taken for granted, with many compulsions and what not. One may add or edit this list, but one must ask, can planners be more sensitive and responsible for such issues? City does provide opportunities of certain kinds that cannot be ignored. But if human feelings also get reflected in some form, will be more appreciable. One needs to check along with employment and facilities what else city can technically offer, what city should offer. Here I have said, life is where there is a scope of personal expression. The visual here addresses too, intensity of living can make city vibrant, but if not work out properly, if not resolved properly, if not planned properly, it can create difficulties. You can see that in these visuals and such things we affect quality vibrancy of life. For design of a certain kind, building up of data is very important, very essential. As we all know, in contemporary time, data is a strength, data is power. In future, data will determine future actions. For city planning also, data is very important, very, very important. So much data is available also, but all talk about quantitative things. Maybe what a database we still need to build up is data on qualitative aspects of life in city, data that can help incorporating systems with human life, data on psychological study of city dwellers, data on dreams of city people, data on what people expect from city, specifically and collectively. Data that will clearly state as per people's perception where city fails. Data that will help in planning in Indian context. The information that is like learning from our ancient wisdom. We also need to collect data on behavior and habits of Indians in different social groups. We need to build up data on relations with the relationship between lifestyle and earnings and data on many smaller, smaller aspects like it's very small thing. How many vegetable lorries are required for different social groups? How many four wheelers will get added in a given housing colony in next 10 years? How long would should drive a two wheeler every day? without having long-term negative effects on a body. For Indian people, this is with reference to. What are the important habits of a common man that should get reflected in city planning by choice? What kind of conditions will be preferred by what social group for spending leisure time? How much travel distance is preferred by people for going to workplaces or even going to everyday shopping. What one would not like to experience, not like to experience <coughs> while on journey. What kind of relationship by and large one would like to have with elements of nature? What is the relationship between city design and crime, if at all it exists? What is the wastage of fuel at different crossroads? Where such waste is minimum and maximum and why so? All such data is required to build up and we need to be very careful and tactful to address to this data to the quality of life. Then only we can really plan cities accordingly. We must understand that what information one has will determine what decision it takes. 
the visual ear address is 2 there must be a very good scope for personal life nicely interwoven with the system people always look for it if not available they will carve it out okay along with many other things what one requires is a place in city where one can feel related with relevance one requires unique places of different kinds of different scale in required hierarchy at most strategic locations where one can feel sense of warmth sense of freedom sense of belongingness sense of consideration such places should be with required facilities with which one can relate and associate with which one can identify should be distributed logically having intensity of certain type reflecting cultural culture and society a place that brings about pleasant variations that has different cultural denotations a place with that full monitoring of variables and constants with some crafted elements to enrich visual experiences such a place that reflects cultural social recreational hierarchy a place that gets connected with transportation system pedestrian or public or both as the requirements may be most importantly a place that gives sense of pride and contentment a place has nicely incorporated elements of nature that is traditional historic cultural and national significance a place that is full of life to accommodate life everyone's life city can have series of such places and this is only the aspect for every tactful decision such prerequisites must be listed like what we talked about place when can make list of other decisions to be taken and then make a similar list in terms of what should be expected from that my last statement of this slide here is though man is a social animal he loves to respect his territory idea of a planner should be to strike a balance because what is happening that on one hand man wants to be man wants to be part of many and on other hand he wants to retain the dignity of his territory so how to strike a balance that's plan to solve the visual here address is to understand how one responds one will have to take into account the manner in which responses gets created in a given condition now for better quality of life one needs to ask what kind of places are required in what kind of cities or what structure of cities what are the ways in which human aspirations can be responded to positively what kind of city conditions will make one feel proud dignified how to establish micro scale so that one can feel related it will not over power any existence or it will not be over dominating making human scale very important you need to relate to the human scale now this can be with respect to one individual or smaller group or the larger group identification of scale is very critical what should be experience every 10 minutes 30 minutes one hour and more so for example if i am traveling in a city what i must experience every 10 minutes or every 30 or every 60 or every 120 or if i am walking or this or that meaning matlab you require certain type of experiences at regular interval 
Now the nature of experience will depend on this intervals and what it is intended for. This kind of experiences are to be strategically decided, planned, worked out. How to work out hierarchy in different order? By elements of nature, that is rain, sun, wind, vegetation, water body, if any, are not taken so seriously. Why such elements are taken as a liability? Why not as an asset? Why we always think of disposing of rainwater? Why we cannot convert it in an opportunity kind of situation? When one talks about inclusive planning, what all gets included and what still gets left out? Do we reduce consumption after increasing it or we work out a system for zero consumption or zero wastage. For example, say we make straight roads for speedy traffic and then introduce speed breakers or we plan for advisable drive facilities. This is a fundamental question. We invite the problem and then we try to look for a solution. Thus, traffic revolves around the life or life should adjust itself around the traffic. Now, what is the point of beginning? Whether we start with life and let things happen around it or let other things happen in whatever way it happens and life will try to find out its lot in that. What is the approach that we are taking? How to enhance human existence and experience? I'm talking about both existence and experience. One needs to ask many such questions to have cities with real substance and planners are the professionals who will begin with asking this kind of questions and looking for solutions, sorting for solutions. Ultimately, our aim, even of this kind of conferences, seminars, is to improve quality of life. We always question what we can do so that people lives you know, goes to the better stage. There should be strong relevance between units and total. Units and total both are important and so both should be respected. Like in city, if you look at the hierarchy, the definition of unit and total, you know, keeps on changing. House is a unit, then the neighborhood is a total. The neighborhood is a unit that's larger area of town is a total. So considering this hierarchy, one needs to work out the characteristic of unit and total and how these two are related, how both respect each other is an issue. Visual here addresses to very interesting thing. You know, you can see people are sitting with intimacy without considering any facility available. You can just see from the visuals what they are looking at. And are we providing that? Are planners providing that? What I'm trying to state here is intimacy can be achieved in many situations. That's what is happening here. But the question is what the provisions are made to achieve this kind of intimacy? The next is one needs to understand how city life gets enlightened. It can be I'm just suggesting few by introducing sense of ownership at different scale for different size of groups, for different objectives and activities, and by having nicely articulated breathing spaces, a strategic locations in a definite hierarchy for well targeted groups. Also, by responding to most kind of needs arising out of diverse requirements of citizens. From well-defined commercial ones to just time pass. Or by discriminating clearly what must be constant and what can be variables. What is to be generalized and what can be specific. By objectively understanding and reflecting behavior pattern and habits of people or by creating pockets with such one, which one or group can relate without compromising with safety and security. 
by understanding and reflecting issues related to health, mental as well as physical, as well as spiritual, as well as social. There is a social phenomena of social health also. Here again, we are talking about only one type of category. Range is wide enough. An entire range must be explored. Possibilities are many. One will have to make an appropriate choice so as to have an effective result. My last statement of this slide is to balance monotonous occupation, cities should offer intense vibrancy. The visual here shows how people gather around anywhere at any given time also to enjoy portion of their life. Addresses to what to do when there is nothing to do is a big question for primary many individuals in city. Okay. For human centric city planning, one needs to have well defined determinants, well drafted problem statement. Defining problem statement is otherwise also very critical in research and also in design, whether it's architecture, product, graphics, or city planning. One needs to have well conceived priorities also. We need to prioritize few things. Well thought of point of beginning with specific reference data. I'm constantly giving importance to the point of beginning because I strongly believe that what you begin with will tell the direction in which you will go. So well thought of point of beginning with specific reference data, well stated intentions will help addressing to the quality of life. If that is the point of beginning, if that is our concern and if our reference data addresses to that. One also needs to determine the bottom line, the minimum to achieve. One can also work on the nature of network of quality places and the range it will cover, range it will offer. One will also have to work out the manner and the mechanism with which any overpowering, any over dominating condition will be brought to perceptually acceptable level. Because in city planning, you may come across many dominating conditions. You require that at certain scale, but the manner in which you make them, the manner in which you articulate them, the manner in, in which you let it grow, you know, should perceptually indicate acceptable scale. In the process of selecting city elements, defining elements for cityscape, that is a cultural, social, contextual, and human relevance, one can have more sensitive and constructive approach. One can select from wider range. One may have to experiment few things in real and see the responses. One can also try for making journey to workplaces more rewarding. Meaning if you are traveling by any mode, the kind of things that you experience on the way should be fantastic. So while going also and while coming back also, you are again charged and you don't feel tired. And often you feel like going, you feel like traveling. Feeling like traveling is also not a good idea, mainly in this COVID-19. But keeping that aside, I think it is important to enjoy journey. The way we enjoy stay, we should enjoy journey also, and we should enjoy when we are not doing journey or we are not stationed. When there is a zero-ness, we should enjoy even that. I think that is the main essence of life. While working on range of choices that can be offered to citizens, we can open up larger kit and much larger kit in city. Conditions would, should get determined by pattern of human behavior. This is what is important. How people behave that will help people taking decisions in terms of what should get determined. 
what one should work upon. The visual here say, finally, what matters is comfort. And one achieves that with whatever resource available. Like if you see the visual one, it's on the uh, walkway that one is just put up some kind of charpai and people are on family is, is sitting there and the lady is also having lunch at that point of time. The second visual I like really very much because there is a one person who is staying, this is from Ahmedabad in, in, in a Narapura region. There is a one person who has converted his lari into his moving uh, uh, dwelling unit and he has uh, some uh, cycle also that is this fellow is disabled person. So he always goes with this wherever he goes and wherever he is, he rests, that's, that's his place, that's his house. So uh, he find out comfort there. As again, the last one, it is a traditional coal house of a rich merchant maybe. And you see how, how things are you know, taking shape there. Okay, so now we go to the next. Ha, huh. design or planning is nothing but making choices between opposites. One will have to decide from either or conditions. But after deciding for one, the other will also require to be resolved. It is like deciding for what is to be given more importance first and then the second one will come. Like you give more importance to car movement or pedestrian circulation, feeling of congestion or sense of freedom, common determinants you give more importance to or unique gesture you are working on, system network is your priority or human network based on human relationships is your concern. Employment or engagement, centralized amenities or distributed virtues, evenly distributed opportunities, system facility or human experiences. Whether you are working on generalized statement or with series of specific intentions, you are talking about mechanical travel distance or a human reach, comfortable human reach, projected growth or definite psychological territory, rational decisions is your priority or emotional intervention is your key issue, machine like product or crafted places, ordered condition or sensitive variations. Like this, this, these are very sensitive issues. But one will really have to carefully look into this before one actually one have to make a list of this kind of things and establish priorities and also work out a mechanism. The list continues: system-based approach or human approach, and many more. With conscious and proper choice, with backup of systematic research and data with considerations of every section of society, with proper care for outsiders as well, because we are not talking about only the dwellers. Millions of people visit city every day. So what about them? One will have to make choice considering all this to enhance human life. Incorporating constructive framework of mechanical systems. And also, work on second layer decisions, something that you have not considered as of the priority. Second layer decisions to incorporate left outs. Personal engagement and involvement can be a key issue in planning. This is what I'm trying to tell. The visual here tells, city generates employment, like you can see here. But the question is, is it planned that way? Like whatever three examples that we are looking at the employment generation, are cities planned for this? Is city planning sympathetic to this kind of people or not? Have we made any pockets for this kind of people? Is a question. Okay. Now, the route can be many. But any systematic approach will surely yield result. result. 
the design process must be well defined with necessary provisions for lateral alterations as well lateral alterations as well i repeat the stages listed here under can give broad outline for the kind of planning i am talking about one can start with identifying human aspirations that is the point of beginning i am talking about that must be reflected in city planning then establish priorities for such aspirations along with that infer for likely changes that may come up tomorrow then decide for mechanism for their implementation identify nature that requires sensitive monitoring nature matlab both i am talking about kudrat also and the nature matlab nature of elements nature of decisions both one will have to at some stage make layers for every decision solution design decisions design solutions then superimpose them to understand impact of one on another then you will have to start resolving the differences without compromising with the priorities with which you have started then develop inclusive comprehensive plan in operating mechanics of system along with quality of life check for its working conditions take a final call in the process the functional values of the city must not get compromised with in any manner and also the quality of life must be celebrated so on one hand we are saying that we will not compromise and on another hand we will say that we will celebrate and both has to be done parallelly simultaneously this is not much different from regular planning practices the difference will be in concerns here the difference will be in concerns priorities references backup data and such other basis of design of planning in planning larger decisions are concerns smaller ones are for fine tuning the visuals here say openness often helps expressing freedom that gets governed matlab freedom gets governed by nature of said openness this openness okay many things can be said but let's cut short now otherwise also this is very heavy topic my conclusions it is important to come to common consensus like city is not a machine to live in remember someone has said house is a machine to live in i'm just enlarging the scale i neither believe in house nor believe in machine there is one architect who has made this statement house is a machine to live in and i have visited that place 80% of the houses are not occupied people have left because they are not comfortable to live in a machine so similarly city is not a machine to live in it should be very sympathetic to every man and responds to human qualities human aspirations human values human dignity means life man is highly accommodative creature this is important you know we get adjusted to i think in recent future we will get adjusted to even corona it can accommodate himself to even very adverse condition this is at an advantage of planners but in the process man should not be taken for granted this is what is important sometimes in the city planning i have a feeling that man is taken for granted in the process of checking his limit matlab limit of a man and if you do that in real sense he may start reacting disproportionately i am using word disproportionately very diplomatically actually word would have been more wider one requires good data bank for planning 
the information on finer aspects of human life with this with his habits and aspirations it is also understood that importance of mechanics of system cannot be ignored parallelly let there be well structured reflection of non material finer aspects of life finally through city planning bring smile on faces i think it is our job to, as academician as a professional as planner as architects you know to bring smile on faces it is a larger perception it is a larger feeling that through city planning we just provide facilities sometimes the facilities are also at stake because of so many other reasons but we hardly plan to bring smile on faces okay life should be in the center of every human creation the visual demonstrate here are the examples of unique coexistence when i mean by coexistence i am not talking about human and hum human i am talking about many other things human and animals also human and plantations also whether one believes it or not every place on earth is for combined living matlab it is not for man only like you can see in the first visual there is a dog there is an elephant in the second visual there is a milk wala selling the milk in the morning and just at the back a dog is nicely observing watching witnessing and this is a very unique uh, scene that we generally have must be in other cities also but i refer to gujarat that uh, they feed pigeons is feed sparrows they feed ants so in our culture coexistence is must unfortunately i don't have any visual that talks about the plantation also the green existence also so whether one believes it or not every place in earth is for combined living one can see here how life celebrates togetherness this is what i wanted to talk about in this paper if i repeat my main concern is quality of life in city there are questions questions with respect to the planning process the planning priorities the planning planning concerns also with respect to the management of city also that i have not talked about because many times there are administrative and political decisions that creates the kind of interference but if one is really addressing the quality of life i think cities will be a fantastic place to live on earth because it provides all other facilities so that will not be the problem only the quality of life is a problem i am still looking for a person who will say that my retired life i will spend in a metropolitan city if he is staying in a small town in the metropolitan city people migrate to smaller towns in retired life or they go to the native place so let's work out something let's think let's deliberate on thank you good day Rita can you just switch on your mic Thank you sir it was indeed a very splendid and thoughtful presentation it portrayed so well the whole mechanics of different systems which are running simultaneously to evolve a very vibrant space the city but yes we also need to answer the immeasurables the intangibles and not only the tangible factors as you said it has definitely rekindled the thought of finding ways and order in the vibrancy and the chaos of urbanity the city definitely should have a spirit a soul and a livable place for all all kinds of people all people from all social strata we need to respect the environment social cultural context also in the true sense so many such thoughts and questions are also arising in our participants mind and we have already few questions in the chat box i would like to take the few questions 
Yes, please. Yes, sir. What should be ideal parameters for assessing the quality of life in cities? <laughs> uh, you did a, mention that, yeah. No, no, no. But, uh, I'm, I, I, I laughed because of other things. Actually, during my presentation only, I was looking at the chat box and the kind of thing uh, that was popping up. All right, sir. Uh, and there are um, many confusion, many questions, many stands one has taken, you know, through the uh, the chat box. Uh, yes. See, if you start discriminating life. Mm -hmm. You and I are different. But if you are running you will also run, I will also run. So they, there are certain things that are common in human beings. As a planner, we need to identify that's what I had said. What is the bottom line? What is the minimum? I just tell you, where did this whole presentation come idea? As you had mentioned, in my introduction, I was a design chair at Asmita, Mumbai. Yes. So whenever I had a time, I would love to go somewhere because uh, my family is at Ahmedabad and I go for short period. So whenever I had time, there was no place to go. So I will go to a railway station of local train. And there will be many people like me. They were not knowing what to do in Mumbai when there is nothing to do. So I was having conversation with them. And I must have, I cannot use the word interviewed, but I asked many people there that are you here by choice or this is the only thing that is with you. So the larger uh, answer that I got was there is nothing else. You know, Mumbai is such a fantastic city. So many facilities, metro, international flights, but if I have half an hour, what do I do? You know, beyond the territory of my house. So now it's a big question. It's a very big social question that these people are asking. So I started investigating what all they do, you know, this kind of people in maybe last 10 months or maybe 12 months. And then I found out that we are making cities, we are creating cities in which this kind of questions are never asked. So I thought, let me pose, you know, a kind of series of questions in front of all the scholars, you know, students also, PhD students also, scholars also, professionals also, academicians also. And let's start thinking about something like this, that what can we really do? Now the question is how to address to the quality of life. If the answer were that simple, people would have addressed by now. The fundamental thing is uh, we have never asked about our quality of life. What do I expect? And now in city, we have to generalize for maybe 70, 80 lakhs people. So what is the bottom line? I think the best thing is to interview 100 people of different age group, different sex, different social groups, different income group, whatever classification that you have. And then tell them that what they would love to do if there is nothing else to do beyond territory of their house. And then make a list of it. And in my presentation, I said that what you would like to experience every 10th minute when you are walking or when you are traveling, is, is this not a very important thing to consider in city planning? And will it really consume great resources? And even if it is consuming great resources, otherwise also it is consuming great resources. If we are not addressing to life as such, if you see the history of development of city, means I, I, it was not my idea to talk about that. But the idea of city itself is a chaotic. You know, if you see the, history, uh, the development of city, it all started with the industrial revolution. You try, the primary concern was employment. Employment. Yeah. Now, no one has questioned, you know, till now, that are we doing anything other than the employment? City started with an idea of generating employment or a place that generates employment and becomes a magnet. It is still the same. It is still the same. 
Now, why in last two hundred years and whatever uh, efforts that are made, you know, they are also kind of my dream. I mean, my idea of following geometry, my idea of going to the green belt, my idea of doing this. But even it is just my idea. It is not even supported by substantial data. So is it not a duty of we, the schools, the institutes, the academicians, to really think of what is really required? And this is not a small task. And there are no sort of like I may uh, like mithai. You may like farsa. That's perfect. But what is the bottom line of mithai and farsa? That we both of us wants to eat something that celebrates taste. Unless we come down to this, this average, this understanding, this generalization, I think we cannot take next step in city planning. And what is happening nowadays? The cities are not controlled. Whatever you say, you know, one third of the city development goes out of control. And once it is going out of control, it really becomes chaos. Like many of us uh, mentioned in that chat box, they have used the word chaos. It is really going to become chaos because we don't know what exactly we are supposed to do. Next. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That means <laughs> there is yes, sir. We have a lot of questions. Yeah, but I think you've quite answered. And I think it's what what is important is the uh, paradigm shift in the thought process. And which starts with this, uh, with academics as well. You know the way we are teaching the students, the future budding architects. Yes, sir. So there's one more question who's asking, how have you applied this perspective of people-centric planning, which you believe in and which you've been saying in your presentation, in your own project? Uh, can you elaborate from your own work? <laughs> Any, yes. Uh, yes. Why not? I I will I I'll start with a simple example that I gave to one student last semester. You know, I I was parallelly teaching. I always teach at two three institute together because I'm not full time engaged anyway. So there is one interior designing school, and at primary level, first year level, we had given a project of interior design of a small residence. You know, uh, maybe uh, for them only, and maybe with parents. So one student came up with the presentation. I asked, if there is nothing to do, you don't want to look at TV, you don't want to eat. you don't want to sleep you don't want to do whatever in this house what you will do is there any place where you can sit quietly for half an hour just doing nothing and just thinking about yourself if you don't have any place like this in your house that is not a house that is just a facility the house should reflect my personality my demands demand doesn't mean that i need water so i have a paniyara that's not a demand i can go and bring water somewhere else but if 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 i want to be with myself what do i do similarly at the city level a group of people or this or that like i think in some of the visuals i i i have shown that people sitting on on footpath they are sitting on anything anything that is available so are we thinking of this that's a question right so i understand so thank quality, you so quality of life yeah. can be addressed too yeah. by questioning the basic question that i asked in my presentation if you are if there is no definite slot say if i am an architect and if i am design chair in one college i have a slot you know for me in that city but suppose i don't have any slot in this city we uh, uh, whether city city will still accept me happily most sympathetically or not that's question and if i tell you honestly all the 16 slides that i have shown each slide can be elaborated for one hour this is this is like a, a kind of uh, you know run through the yes, yes, <laughs> large larger yes. larger areas of concerns uh, please next if yes. any so as since we don't we are running short of the time uh, sure. we would not be able to take any more questions but uh, i think you kind of really sum it all very well uh, the planning should be human centric and we really need to rethink how we design cities and what is our need to be part of the city so i'm i'm sure these thought processes 
will uh, definitely change the way we are going to design and plan as a team. So, so. <laughs> so, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for responding to those questions as well. Thank you to well, you also and uh, to MMSA team also. Thank I, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I extend my regret because we're not able to take any more questions because of the perfect. time. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. 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 Well, thank you all. Uh, we have come to the end of the lecture series today. And just to brief you up, we touched upon the topic of historicity and modernity, the whole journey with reference to Turkish architecture and city, the urban fabric with its complexity. And we had a lot of deliberations over both the topics. I would like to really thank our esteemed speakers, Dr. Ebru and Dr. Hemantwala for their valuable knowledge and enlightening us mm -hmm. and having those thought provoking ideas in us. Well, I would like to end this session with a beautiful quote by the famous architect I. M. Pai. Architecture is a very mirror of life. You only have to cast your eyes on the building to feel the presence of the past, the spirit of the place. They are the true reflection of a society. With that note, thank you all for your active wait, part. Wait, of the wait, wait, wait. This is my fundamental question now. Yes. No, as I said, for cities, for court also, why have to refer to Pai? You know what? You know what Kautilya has said. You know what Vidur has said about the city planning. You know what our people have said about the city planning. Let's. Pai ne apni baat ki hai. Ham apni baat kare na. Pai ki baat yahan pe. Pai pai ki baat yahan pe kyun laga rahe ho aap log? Because our inspiration. No, 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 no. The fundamental thing is, our pass, our database is not there. You understand? You don't know what Kautilya has said about the city planning. You don't know what Kautilya has said about the city or what Samaragna Sutradhara has said about city planning, or what has been talked about city planning in Aparajit Prucha, you don't know. I'm asking you openly. Yes, sir. And probably so, it is so, my lack of knowledge, probably, but I just took it as an inspiration. And no, uh, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing you. I'm criticizing the entire professional body now. That our models are Western. Our quotes are Western. Our, so our ideas are Western. And we are aligned with GMT. We are not aligned with IST. And this is what is happening. We will never understand our problem. We will never understand our issues. We will never understand what should be our concern and priorities. We will never understand our people. We will never understand our resources. Start doing that. Sorry. And thank you. Absolutely. No, no, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> it is, this is definitely, I just took it as an inspiration. It could be used in any context. So that is how I have, uh, since it's a national international, so I have used everybody. Yeah. Thank you again for uh, everybody for your patient listening and active participation. You all have been very wonderful audience. We shall resume back at the same time tomorrow to continue our lecture series. And just to brief you up, the speakers for tomorrow will be Dr. Zebun Nasreen Ahmed from Bangladesh and Architect Prasanna Desai from Pune, India. So good afternoon all and have a nice day. Stay safe have a nice and healthy. Day. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, everybody. Uh, shall I leave or what?